You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for January 1st, 2021. It's still not safe for work. Recorded live from the world headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where, now that we're on Substack, we can tell you what we really think. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. We're not on Substack. We're not on Sub we, no. we I know some people that are on Substack, and I do there are some people on Substack that I like a lot. Yeah. Uh yeah. but no, we're not going the Substack route because we've been our own executive producers now for yeah. What's well, coming up on 11 years in two weeks. So, yeah, we're good. I'm on Blogger with Scan. I certainly miss <laughs> Scan. Remember I, when Blogger was down all the time? Oh, I do. I remember when yeah. Scan was the only way you could keep checking comments. And, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, we've, been, yeah. we've been around oh, for a while. You know, we used to walk Blog Uphill twice <laughs> both ways in a foot of snow back in the old time. <laughs> but blogging is dead and we I know that because every year we're told that. So I guess we are um wherever we're at. Yeah. And you're the original substacker anyway. You I really am. are. I, am. I mean your blog has just been going forever and you're you're a great writer and wow. there Thank you go. You. Thank you. There I, you go. I have everything I ever wanted off the internet for blogging. You do. I do. You do. I'm yeah. a good good woman. I have occasionally someone sends me a bottle of uh, very fine scotch for sipping and uh, fame and fortune. I actually, those last two I don't have, but really <laughs> I can live without those. <laughs> All I would really ask, truly, I know I bitch about this a lot. I don't care about personal vindication of anything, except I really like someone to mention, you know, on the news that they know who coined the phrase dumpster fire. That'd be, <laughs> nice. That'd be really nice because it's everywhere. It's just like haunting yeah. me. But what I really want is for the fundamental liberal ideas and ideals and history and how we got where we're at to be acknowledged. It would be yeah. great if if some long-term network that, had, let's say, had had a show on the Sunday mornings for like 25 years were to do a show every now and then that says, you know who really got this shit right? Liberals did. Liberals got has been getting this stuff for, right. For it's, more than one presidential administration, for yeah. many presidential administrations, as a matter of fact, liberals yeah. have gotten it right. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, that's th those uh, claims have been overtaken, Drift Glass, by the bulwark. Oh, I know. I who know. has been right for exactly one presidential administration and will not shut up about it. Yeah. I, I promised um, my beautiful <laughs> wife that I would not talk about this. So she did, which is great. <laughs> Um, I will, yeah. however, be writing it up later because they, they do it – now it's a, a weekly feature of, oh, my God, can you believe how right we were? And how come <laughs> people won't acknowledge it? And these fuckers who are just noticing the Republican Party is bad today, why won't they acknowledge they're wrong? Um, that is basically um, – there's a five-minute segment in every Bulwark podcast where that – And that why, won't, why won't people believe us uh -huh. that we're right? Why uh -huh. won't people acknowledge that we're right when – we're on MSNBC. We're right. getting a tongue bath from Brian Williams all the time. Honestly, about it reminds how me, amazing we are. Yes. It reminds me a little bit of, of Glenn Greenwald. I'm breaching all kinds of walls. No, right. no, Just, we're yeah, not. This is Glenn Greenwald no, 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 free no. podcast. In, in a very specific <laughs> way. There was a period of time of about eight months, maybe nine months, when Glenn Greenwald would go from network to network to network. Yes, yes. That nobody would let him talk. <laughs> I remember that. And, and you have the bulwark people going from MSNBC to NBC to CNN to the Washington Post to the New York Times complaining that no one will acknowledge how right they are or pay He's attention to He's still doing that, Drift Glass, yeah, He's, except he just goes on Tucker Carlson and does well, it. And, and I'm being censored. And Substack. So let's bring it all, you know, <laughs> close it all up into one big thing. Um, Can I, I just say? Of course. It's your podcast. Uh I, I tweeted this this week, and it's a common phrase, but and I did not coin it. But the confidence of mediocre white men. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, God save us. God save us from the arrogance of mediocre white men. A mediocre white men, honest to God. Okay, yeah. let's get to our notes, because you, you actually did something this week, Drift Class, that we are known for, and that is remembering the past. Yeah, I did. I violated all the traditions 
of of uh, blogging and writing in this uh, now 2021. And I went back to, uh, because we are literally recording this on New Year's Day. This is not a pre-record. Right. This is not nope. a best of. This is not an no, encore this is performance. New Year's Day. In <laughs> no, the this is New Year's Day. Yes. Um, it's icy outside. I took some pictures of the trees in the street, and it's all lovely and ice covered and treacherous. So we'll probably be staying in for the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I went back and looked at uh, our podcast from January third, twenty twenty, which was pre pandemic, but it was, it was probably fifty two podcasts ago. It was I would almost imagine exactly fifty two podcasts ago. Yeah. Now that you mention yeah. it, yeah. And what were we saying the the first day, our first podcast day of the new year of twenty twenty? And it's remarkably consistent. Um, I, I hate to say repetitive because that's not true, but it's remarkably <laughs> consistent. First thing was that uh, we noted how on that day, or at least the last, previous 48 hours, the liberal superpower of memory had made a big comeback on Twitter. Um, Soledad O'Brien, bless her heart, had dug up Kathleen Parker's Wall Street Journal op-ed from 2016, which was entitled, Relax, whoever wins will be fine. And that was kicked around like a soccer ball. Now, I must note that no actual pundits have ever been fired for having horrible, stupid, dumb, bad takes. Mm-hmm. But it is uh, it is important to remember that they suck at their job and then ask the question, why do they have that job? Um, everyone was also making a, a great sport about Maureen Dowd's 2016 New York Times op-ed entitled Donald the Dove, Hillary the Hawk. Wasn't that exciting? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Now, so people I, were remembering 2016 back in the beginning yes, of 2020. Were. Yes. Well, well, daring liberals were. Everyone else was pretending that, you know, Bush who? What? No, Obama? Yeah. I never heard of the guy. Um, more than 200 Republican lawmakers signed a letter. Was it to overturn the election? No, the election hadn't happened yet. It was asking the Supreme Court to get rid of Roe versus Wade. Because that's what the Republican Party was all about. Still is. And Joan Walsh, our friend Joan Walsh, did good service with her end of the decade, both siderism has screwed us lamentation, entitled, This Fucking Decade. For years, media and political elites refused to acknowledge the growing racism and radicalism of the Republican Party. Their both sidesism led to the GOP's Trump takeover. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it, this is, I gotta say, this is a, a success story. Um, the mm-hmm. idea of, of reducing a very simple liberal truth to a, to a, a bumper sticker mm-hmm. has merit. Both sides don't. Yep. Has And both siderism sucks. And that sort of thing has have really taken off in the last couple of years because mm-hmm. it is such a reflex among the horrible, horrible political press in this country. You can tell they have such a hard on to get back to both sides in everything. And Trump just won't let them do that because he's so manifestly awful. And the Republican Party is so manifestly treasonous. They just can't do it. And so um, every time they try, they are dogpiled by a bunch of you know liberal people out there who were like, no, 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 no. Now, it didn't, again, it didn't cost anyone their jobs, but it is, it's important that that is now a thing people notice when journalists, journalists do it and understand why they're doing it, which is to lie about politics to protect the Republican Party. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the GOP's uh, blessing and curse, yes. their secret weapon and the weapon that is a ticking time bomb in their midst. Mm-hmm. And that is the Republican base. Yes. Uh, Drift Class calls them reprogrammable meat bags, but I have noticed, and and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Drift Class, but it seems that there is some resistance to reprogramming going on. Sometimes. Among the meat bags, <laughs> yes. Sometimes. Um, Fox News has lost a tremendous share like half a million p- viewers in the since the election they, they're, they're all listening to this podcast now is that what they're doing no they're all, no? all okay. they've switched to newsmax they switched uh-huh. to newsmax mm-hmm. they switched to oan they are seeking out other media and uh you know you if you look on twitter uh in quotation marks for the words i only watch lou dobbs yeah you will find that yeah, they don't want to be reprogrammed into accepting defeat. Right. Uh, and 
they're willing to be very selective about where they get their news. And it's really important to to understand that they call it news. Yes, they really believe it. They, they truly really believe, believe it. that news should make them feel good. Right. All the time. All the time. And and, and that's that's what makes the, a thing true is right. that it tickles their ganglia. Right. Right. And that means and that makes it true. If it's if it's what they already agree with, that makes it true. They, we've reached that level of brainwashing. Yes. Where we've we've flipped. It's not. I will listen to right wing propaganda and believe it. It's mm-hmm. the right wing propaganda has to be what I believe. Yes. Or I won't watch it. And that is dangerous. You can't reach those people. And we've talked about that before, but. Uh, it is it is destructive and it is hurting the party uh, and it, and fracturing it. It is the party. It is the party, it but it's also hurt. when you look at how uh, fractured it's going to become now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you 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 made me laugh, and I really didn't want to laugh at this. Sorry, but. Uh, the one of the president's attorneys who's doing all the fundraising, Lynn Wood. Yes. Uh, today he is predicting that uh, <laughs> none other than the vice president of the United States, Mike Pence, yeah. is going to be arrested mm-hmm. and executed for treason. Yeah. Uh, he's saying this on Twitter. Yeah, and it must be true because he's saying it on Twitter. Because he's saying on tw- he's saying say it, it on it Twitter. True. I've seen this a million times. You couldn't say it if it wasn't true. You couldn't say it if it wasn't true, right? Uh, and I reported that tweet, and I and many others did as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but <laughs> the what what made me laugh? That did not make me laugh because I don't think threatening elected officials with assassination, which is what he essentially did, uh-huh. uh, is a good idea. It, it martyr you're martyring the wrong person if you're if you hate them so much that you're willing to kill them, you're martyring them, and yeah. that doesn't help your cause. Uh, but you said, where is Orly Tate's now? <laughs> yeah, somewhere she's just crying in her beer, she like I, I eating her grief I, over I, how I didn't go far enough. She missed her opportunity to go far enough. Oh, and and you and I said I I believe that the person of the year, the the man of the year, should be Jeff Gannon, and the woman of the year should be Orly Tate's because yeah. Orly Tate's bug-eyed, crazy conspiracy birther monger. Was mm-hmm. the mother of the movement? Yep. Um, and, and and mind you, she she again was a manifestation of a sick, depraved party that preexisted her. And Jeff Gannon was the father of fucking fake news, a fake name, fake ID, fake tags, lie all the time. That's the business model for one American network. That's the business model for eighty percent of Fox News. So again, these people, to quote Batman, oh, these weren't monsters. They're ahead. They were ahead of the curve. This yeah. is the Republican Party that you and I and most liberals I know could see coming down Michigan Avenue decades ago. This is where they were always going to go. And um, I, I think actually the, the to not push the programming metaphor too hard, but the reason that they're losing – Fox is losing to even crazier sites is because every one of these people has an operating system. Mm-hmm. And the operating system says – I am always right about everything. Mm-hmm. I'm never mm-hmm. wrong. I'm never wrong. Liberals are always wrong. Everyone else is wrong. The worst that can happen is that we're both wrong. And the only way you can be wrong as a conservative is to not be right wing enough. It's never mm-hmm. that you, you should have been more liberal or more generous or more kind. Yeah. You weren't yeah. crazy enough. And on top of the operating system, you can load all kinds of programs. And Fox News has tried to load programs that says, no, maybe we were wrong. Maybe we lost. Like, nope, nope. It's like trying to load Apple software onto a PC. It's like, nope, mm-hmm. not going to mm-hmm. accept it. That is, it, nope, nope, not. And what happens is in computers in the, in the old mainframe days, you get something called thrashing, which is where the computer got conflicting instructions and didn't know what to do. So mm-hmm. it sort of flail around until one of them took precedent or one of them was knocked down. And these people will always seek out the propagandist who offers them the best heroin. The mm-hmm. most pure, the most delicious, the most the most all encompassing lie, because you need a big lie because because their lives are made up of of just a uh, a Jenga stack of lies. That's their personality. It's one lie on top of another on top of another. That that thing starts to tip over, 
their personality collapses. They have nothing mm-hmm. because liberals were right all along. That's that's psychic death for them. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they will not permit that to happen. So they will find someone in a suit sitting in front of a camera who will tell them, don't worry, it's all a conspiracy. It's all a big conspiracy. Liberals are behind it. And whoever happens to sort of tumble out of the uh, uh, the good graces of the crazy center, um, Mike Pence is now a traitor. Yeah, because Who Mike are? Pence... Mike Pence calmly asked the court and the Justice Department agreed with him to to please ask the court not to allow Louis Gohmert to sue him. Right. So he's a traitor. Because because there is a, there because there's a process. There is a process by which the House and the Senate can ostensibly mm-hmm. overturn the vote of the Electoral College. It, there is a process in place to do that. And thanks to Josh Hawley, that process is going to go forward. It's going to fail, but it's going to go forward because they do have one senator who will sign on to yeah. questioning the ballots. Right. And so they didn't have that for Al Gore. No. And again, <laughs> the the insanity is, why are they doing this? Why are they making this January 6th, you know, play to try to, t- to overturn it. Why are they doing that? It's because of Republican primary voters. Right. It's because Donald Trump controls enough Republican primary voters that their jobs are threatened. Mm-hmm. And Republican primary voters have always been the problem. Yes. You can't call it Trumpism when before Trump, there were hundreds of thousands of Republican primary voters willing to vote for Newt Gingrich, for Marco Rubio, for, you know, people, <laughs> they were willing to vote for Ben Carson. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you have a Republican primary voter in large enough numbers to sway Iowa and New Hampshire and those early races, uh, you've got a lot of power. Yes, you do. And and the corollary to that, which is a term that we didn't disagree over, but we I was looking for the right term, is, mm-hmm. is, is like willful blindness. Yeah, willful there blindness. Is, yeah. There is an absolute willful blindness on the part of the mainstream press to see this at all. Because yeah, they don't want to see Republican primary voters no. as a problem. Because that means 73 million potential customers for their pro- for their advertisers are what's killing their country. And hurting democracy. And right. They, and that's 73 million, as we often say, dick pills, reverse mortgages that they're not right. going to sell over their network. You can't right. come out and say the problem with this country is the guy down the block or the crazy mm-hmm. lady at the mm-hmm. store or the nurse who won't take a COVID shot because she knows it's a conspiracy. Mm-hmm. You can't say that. You can send out um, exploratory safaris into the dark interior of the continent to talk to these people. Well, you can have whole panels of tr- of the Trump voter right. and trying to understand what where they come from. Right. But they didn't just drop off a truck into the Republican primary no, system. They didn't. No. And, and that's the problem. And – at no point have I heard anybody in any position of response. This really is this is the this is the the other plague. Mm-hmm. This is the hurricane. Mm-hmm. This is the volcano. This is the thing that's wrecking this country. Are seventy three million reprogrammable meatheads, and the fact that it is clearly a conspiracy at the very highest level of corporate news that we're just not going to fucking talk about this because well, and and let's are- make sure we we recognize too uh-huh. that. By doing that, they are enabling white supremacy of course and they white are. nationalism. They, and until – Every I, day. As yep. I said before, until the, 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 the cattle car rolls up to their door mm-hmm. and, and, mm-hmm. and boots kick in their door and drag their family off, they're still going to lie about it. They're not going to do a goddamn thing about it because all they see when they look at their, their cross tabs and ratings are 73 million potential customers. And I can't go around calling my customers fascists even though they're clearly fascists. Because that's bad for my bottom line, and this is this is the doom of a corporate media is that there are certain yeah. stories they simply will not acknowledge, and they can't acknowledge the corollary stories either. They can they can put our never Trump friends on television 
all day long. They can give Steve Schmidt and Charlie Sykes literally millions of dollars of free publicity because those people tell the country the problem started in 2016. Mm -hmm. The problem is Trump. Trump hypnotized these people or, or, or did some manifestly weird magical thing that caused this to happen. This is not a long-term problem, and it's not 73 million people. It's a, it's a problem that is containable, identifiable, and has, has a name and a face. And once the name and the face are gone, we can all go back to normal. And that's the reason you see never-Trumpers all over television getting freebies and free publicity and book deals and op-ed columns, and you do not see liberals who are right all along, any of them, anywhere in that ecosystem because what mm-hmm. liberals are telling them is no 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 this is a 50 year old problem as we as we used to as i wrote in a post that went up at um at uh, Batocchio's, his best mm-hmm. of this year um this is the 40th year of the reagan revolution yeah and this is what we're living with um and if i can stretch a metaphor way too far just for a second <laughs> <clears throat> um cleaning out the fridge um, this is a New Year's tradition in many households. I did a little bit of it today. I felt great. Um, I know that that our friend Athena said she was – this is the best day she's ever had because she cleaned out her fridge. Apparently, this happened <laughs> And yeah. if you listen to the plaintive cries of our Never Trump friends, as, as they look at their party as you might look at a cluttered fridge, you know, the, the guy, we got to get rid of the bad stuff. But they go through the thing of like, oh, shit, everything's bad. Everything in this fridge is bad. There's no like leftover Reagan pie that was baked yesterday that's still good. And there's no like fresh creamery Edmund Burke butter. So everything is rotten and brown and smells like shit. And the problem is there's no fresh food coming in. There are no new voters. You can't just cash out 73 million people and get another bunch of tens of millions of good Republicans. There are no good Republicans. So they're fucked because they can sit there and complain all day long about how their party is full of crazy people and we need to do something about it. But what are you going to do? There is no replacement on the way coming to stock your fridge up with good Edmund Burke, David Brooks reading, um, um, true conservative loving voters. Those people don't exist at all. So they're stuck with a problem that they can't identify and they don't dare actually fix because what it means is – we have to turn all power over to the Democrats. <laughs> yeah. We have to – Democrats need to run this shit for the next 40 years because there's nothing left in our party but corrupt, crazy, racist idiots. And we can't risk letting these people anywhere near power. And the end of that sentence is, oh, my God, the left was right all along. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. never going to happen. Let's talk about um, Obama for a minute. Yeah. I remember that guy. Yeah. First of all, we want to thank Barack Obama very, very much for his insights on parenting. Yes. Uh, He appeared on a YouTube channel uh, belonging to an African-American dad who does funny videos about his toddlers. Mm -hmm. And he has two toddler girls, the host of this YouTube channel. And Barack Obama was on talking with him about his memoir and so forth. But also mentioned about raising two girls. And uh, Barack Obama said to this dad, look, you're in huge trouble because I've watched your channel and those (laughs) girls already have you wrapped around their little tiny fingers. I know just how that feels. And I want to prepare you for the fact that at some point in the middle of their teen years, they're going to completely stop talking to you. Thank you, Obama. And that lasts for about five years. And then and then you're okay again. So I just want to warn you about that. And uh, I showed that to Drift Glass. And when we got to the part where Barack Obama said to Drift Glass on the YouTube, and it takes about five years, I could see this weight lifting off of Drift Glass's shoulders. You like, know, oh, it's not me. <laughs> when, when my buddy Barack put his arm around me and said, look, pal, this isn't you. <laughs> This isn't you. This is You're me. still a good stepdad. They just don't want to talk to you because teen. Right. <laughs> Oh. The word teen is in the picture. Now, now yeah. cast your mind back to when you were the, oh, that's right. Yeah. I was, well, I was the asshole, wasn't I? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yes. I get Am it. I the asshole? Yes, yeah. I was. <laughs> I was. Okay. All right. That's cool. And and we have it, I think, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, as far as teenage girls go, they are okay. But they are definitely not uh, as enamored with us as no. people 
as they were when they were eight. You no. know, it's it, they're just not. They are they want to do their own thing. They care much more about their friends yes. than they do about us yes. in in exponential <laughs> form. Yeah. And uh, I've been through this before. I've had teen stepchildren yeah. and raised them. Uh, this is Drift Glass's first time uh, as a parent of teen girls. And, uh, you know, it, it it's hard. It can be hard. I, I had a, I ran yeah. a uh, uh, or helped run a an academic department where yes, you had you hundreds yeah. of people sort of in this age cohort, not quite this this young. Yeah, but, they were a little bit older, but uh, not my but much. Yeah. I could just kick them out. Yeah, I could just you know, yeah. ah, you're gone. That's it. You're done, and and make it stick because I was the sheriff of Dodge. But right, um, right. I can't do that now, and so you know, <laughs> half my vocabulary is now missing. <laughs> um, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, we don't want to kick them out, but no, we, but. No. But there are times when it's like, what did I do wrong? What? I didn't I, do anything wrong. <laughs> and, and then I want to then I want to pivot and go, you mean I'm perfect? And every, no, 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 that's not what we're saying. <laughs> we're saying that this process you're in is normal and you're you're the same goofy fuck up you've always been. Yeah. And they're the same lovely young people they've always been. And you've reached a point where the, the graph lines are sort of crossing each other. Yeah. And, and they need they need to express their independence and they don't have the maturity to do it quite right. yet and the only way they know how is with this extreme i don't need anybody to uh, do anything for me get away you know okay. <laughs> except right. i'm gonna leave my dishes in the sink yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. i mean it's 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 the uh teeter-totter of wanting to remain a child in some ways and absolutely wanting to be an adult in other ways so sure, sure. that's number one number two is uh Several people have have in reviewing Obama's memoir mentioned a section that takes place in Springfield, Illinois. Really? <laughs> yes, because he was in Springfield. He was. Uh, and actually, uh, it's interesting. Springfield is where Barack Obama introduced Joe Biden as his running mate yep. and brought him up. I was there. I brought him up on stage for that. So uh, that was uh he just has connection to Springfield as a state uh, representative, state senator, state senator. State state senator. senator. Yep. Yep. And so uh, he talks about, and I'm going to let you tell the story. He talks about giving the greatest speech that he'd given so far in the state house, right? Right. And this was um, this was during the time when Republicans controlled uh, the Senate, I believe. <clears throat> this was um, uh, the days of, of James Pate Phillips. Pate Phillips. Uh, who's uh, from DuPage County. He was president of the Illinois Senate. He's a Republican. Um, and this was when Barack Obama was a younger man getting a political education. And he had, you know, he had this this piece of legislation that he was sure was going to pass. Um, and he got up and gave a great Barack Obama speech, stirring, brought people to tears, et cetera, et cetera. And Pate Phillips took him aside afterwards and said, that was a great speech. Uh, I'm sure you changed a lot of minds, and I'm sure you didn't change a single vote. And he didn't, because mm -hmm. that's not how shit works in politics. People are mm -hmm. not, this is not, this was when I think young Barack Obama was still enamored of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Yeah. Where you get up and you give the stirring speech and 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 your, your, your uh, nemesis goes out in the hall and says, and tries to shoot himself and fails and says, that young man is completely right. I'm completely wrong. I'm not fit to, that doesn't happen in politics. Mm -hmm. People by and large are not inside the machine moved by rhetoric. <laughs> They're moved by trading votes, by trading favors, and by having the majority. And that's it. And um, that was a really hard lesson for uh, an orator who taught constitution uh, constitutional law to learn, which was how shit actually gets done in everywhere. This is not unique to the Illinois Senate or the Illinois political system or the national. This is how politics works. You elect people and you give them power and they go into a place and they fight over shit and they usually end up compromising and people pissing people off all over the place and getting stuff done. The problem is that in our system, one party has decided it's going to become an opposition party forever. Mm -hmm. It doesn't want to mm -hmm. govern at all. It has it has completely internalized the Reagan-esque um, government is the problem. 
and they built a coalition out of people who all believe government is evil. They built a coalition out of people who believe that uh, we should be living in a theocracy, uh, gun nuts, um, homophobes, xenophobes, uh, people who hate immigrants, people who hate paying taxes, and people who think liberals are communists. That is the Republican Party. And all of those groups have one thing in common. They all fucking hate the government. They mm -hmm. love it when the government gives them shit, but they hate the government. And they finally figured out, if we just break the thing, then we get what we want. Mm -hmm. Even if we were in the minority, even if, even, if they have, even if Democrats have a near indestructible majority for at least a few months, which happened under Barack Obama, if we just stick together, if we refuse to compromise on anything, if we throw sand in the gears at all times and use our privileged access to the media, because the media is never going to blame us for shit, they're going to they're they're wonder why Barack Obama won't lead. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is use our stooges and footstools in the media like Chuck Todd and use our minority status, our obstruction status, to kill everything and then force the president of the United States to do executive actions to get anything done, like helping people not die, keeping people who shouldn't be shoveled out of the country because they were born here or they were brought here as children in the country um, and so forth. And then run against him as a tyrant who uses executive orders. It's perfect. And that is a policy. That's a strategy that appeals to the very base voters we were talking about who hate the government, who hate the government, who really hate the country. And so it's – it's someone called it a self-licking ice cream cone. And that is a lesson that Obama learned, should have goddamn well learned in, this, in the Illinois Senate mm -hmm. and should have learned in the White House. And it took him – a term and a half to sort of get through his head that, oh, whatever I propose, Mitch McConnell's going to destroy because Mitch McConnell just likes destroying everything. And Mitch McConnell knows the way he holds on to power is by wrecking everything, is by mm -hmm. making me the devil. So the idea that I'm going to ever get a compromise from these people is insane. And it is a good lesson in how government is supposed to work, which at the best of times is the speech don't matter, kid. Yeah. <laughs> votes matters, kid. And um, – but speeches do move voters and speeches do move people and speeches do get people off their asses to register. That's what they mean when they say you 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 campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we're, there's so many new voters in Georgia, that's what changes things in politics. So it was good to have that lesson and, and to realize that someone as astute about – a lot about politics as Barack Obama – uh, that was the lesson that he put in his memoir from his yes. time at the state house was yeah. that all the pretty speeches were not going to change the vote of legislators. No. Um, and it, 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 you've got to move the base of your party. And that, you know, it would be nice if someone would pay attention to the democratic base. I don't know when that's going to happen, but um, I don't know either. I just, I just think so far that, Biden's doing a pretty good job. He's got a lot on his plate, but uh, I haven't been terribly unhappy with any of his appointments so far. Well, and there there is one group that pays close attention to the Democratic base, and that's conservative media. <laughs> and, and because we're all, you know, we're all bomb throwing uh, commie oh, yeah. right, baby right, murderers right, right, who need right. to be stopped at any cost. Um, that's it. That's really the only people that take us seriously. <laughs> So uh, what you have in our notes, what's the over under on Republicans in Congress who will turn traitor on the record? Yeah. Uh, the latest count, I think, is 140, actually. The prediction, you mean? Yeah, that's the yeah. prediction. Yeah. Because I, well, yeah. they're all up for re-election in 2022 and, and they no, don't want to be primaried. So and there's no downside to them personally. There's no downside to, you know, going ahead and, and, and applauding Der Fuhrer. You know, there's no there's no there's no one going to in their district going to hurt them over there. Maybe some swing districts, maybe some close. Well, and if, if Nancy Pelosi were to refuse to seat them, they just run right out and fundraise for their. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what Josh Hawley's doing. He's fundraising off of this. Yeah. So well, is, yeah. as long as you can make unlimited money for a political action committee that you can spend any way you want. Mm -hmm. There, You're right. There is no downside. And, and I was listening uh, when I was doing errands the other day. I was listening to someone on the radio talking about what must happen, <laughs> you know, which is always a precarious <laughs> thing to listen to. And what must happen to the Republican Party is they, first of all, the conservative media has to reform itself. 
because <laughs> because this whole thing of just paranoia and feeding red meat to crazy people that that's so destructive that just has to stop and i just was yelling at my radio in the car going, why does it have to stop what is there to stop it what force on earth is there to stop drug pushers from dealing drugs mm-hmm. to drug addicts mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. there isn't any because they're gonna fucking listen to reason because republicans give a shit about this country where have you been the last 30 years none of that is true what you need is a bigger club you need a louder megaphone you need the one thing that liberal wealthy liberals will never ever ever fund which is a big ass loud liberal media to outshout them because these people live in a universe that I can never penetrate, you can't penetrate. They, they, they all they get all their nutrition through you know Rush Limbaugh's sphincter. And I want to I want to disagree with you on that though. All right. in, in one regard, this has been you know the the week between the holidays is incredibly slow news week. True, and substitute hosts on everything and substitute also. engineers. Everybody that is there. You know, 51 weeks out of the year is on vacation this week. And so there, the substitutes that were on during very slow news weeks were either do on, on MSNBC, I'm right. talking about specifically, were either doing year, year in review uh-huh. or COVID numbers right. or Donald Trump is evil, evil right. incarnate. Right. And how evil is he? Is he the worst president ever was, was literally one of the stories they did. Um, and that kind of propaganda to me on the left seems completely unnecessary. Now, maybe I'm up to my ears in it all week. You are, but yeah. So, (laughs) and so I don't, I don't, it's overflow for me to hear it. And maybe for other people, it's actually satisfying to hear that on your, again, I'm using that word news very loosely. And I, I think we need to take control of that word and, and put some accountability behind it. I've said this on Twitter that that word news is very powerful. Uh And if you're going to advertise yourself that you are a news outlet, there needs to be a law that says that your news gathering techniques and your news producing techniques are transparent so that we, we, we have your show notes. We know your, uh, morning meeting where you're going over what is happening and you're not directing what is happening as they do at Fox. Yeah. And we know that from many, many documents. There's a lot of documentation out there and proof that everyone that comes on Fox to be quote unquote interviewed is given talking points and they're the same talking points and it's yeah. talking points of the day. Yeah. And so they all follow that script they aren't being interviewed for their insight. They're being interviewed to repeat insights that the head honchos at Fox want repeated that day. Um, so I don't I don't think that a loud megaphone that's like Fox on the left is what's is gonna is gonna make a change I, to me. I think it would help mm-hmm. if the New York Times had one conservative writer and four liberal writers actually yeah. liberal writers yeah. i yeah. think it would help if instead of a, a handful of stations carrying a couple of liberals on radio that mm-hmm. we had 500 stations across the country carrying liberal radio mm-hmm. broadcasting to mm-hmm. every middlesex village and farm 24 7 i think yeah. it'd be great if we had our own tv network because msnbc is not our tv network yeah. i think yeah. it'd be awesome if we had a bunch of priests who had their own satellite system and their own church who are preaching liberal doctrine every day on television and from the pulpit. That's the machine. I wish there were book publishing houses that did nothing but publish liberal novels and liberal (laughs) treatises and liberal stories and liberal, uh, but but we don't have any of that. And we don't have Mm -hmm. any of that, not because there isn't a market for it or a need for it, but because the people on the right figured out that the way you succeed when you are on minority opinion, when you have a shitty, awful policy portfolio is by lying all the time. And the only way you get away with lying all the time is you do what fascists always do. You seize the radios, you seize the television system. And then you get people who are, are now addicted to the lies. So hooked, they can never leave. I mean, you know, the, the idea that it's like taking an addict and showing them all the terrible travails and hardship, harvesting their drug causes to people along the road. 
Is that going to break them of the habit? No. Showing conservatives all the damage that they are doing, that their ideology does, that their propaganda does to the country, you think that's going to change their mind? Of course not. They don't give a shit. They care about what they care about. And I, and maybe it's because I don't have any better idea other than a shooting mm-hmm. war to, to, to break the dam. But there really is a Fox Nation and a normal nation, and we are mm-hmm. irrevocably at war with each other. And there's mm-hmm. no reason for us – to pretend we can compromise our way out of this because that we tried that. It was called the Obama administration. And there's no reason to believe they're going to lay down their weapons because they're not. So we're at stalemate. And the only thing that fixes a stalemate is either an overwhelming force from one side or the other or attrition. You just grind the other side down. And that's what we have going for us is demographics. Is Fox News viewers yeah. are aging yeah. out. They're, the average yeah. age of Fox News, is, as the joke goes, is dead. Um, mm-hmm. so it's, it, that's the only thing we've got going for us, but this is a long, hard slog, which is why if you want a 2020 retrospective of what we lost last year, you're not going to do, you're not going to hear on this podcast Be- because if you want to hear that, why this year was actually worse than 1968, for example, just listen to every episode of the professional left going back 52 weeks and you'll, <laughs> you'll get it. You'll, you'll get yeah. it. Instead, right, right. Uh, we've already sort of touched on this, but I want to specifically focus on two things that disappeared in 2020. Uh-huh. The first is any faith in polling numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Pollsters after 2016 says we really have to, you know, recalibrate who does what and who knows what and the fact that we're not obviously there's a whole bunch of people out there who are crazy right-wing, you know, white nationalists that we're not getting on the polls, so we'll we'll reweight the polls. Well that, that they just blew it up in their face this year. Republican turnover did not go down. It went up massively, which is why the never Trump thing is such bullshit. Um, So the idea that polls tell you anything about what's going on in the country is just bullshit, which is kind of scary because that means you don't know what to what policies you have or how many people you have or what's really going on out there. You're you're sort of stuck with anecdotal evidence. But I think we can pretty much say based on this evidence, the, the last election turnout is that there are 60, uh, 73, 75 million people who are unsalvageable lumps of white nationalist stupid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, 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 and they're going to vote that way no matter what. Right. And they do turn out. Yes, they do. And, and, and also that you can't trust polls. I mean, I think we learned this in 2016. You can never trust polls. You have to fight like you're 10 points behind in yeah. every election right through Election Day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And the second thing that disappeared, and this is going back to what we said earlier, is the existence of liberals. (laughs) Liberals simply cease to exist this year. As I already touched on, and as as my lovely wife already mentioned, there is now a a cottage industry within the Never Trump movement about self-congratulating themselves about how how righteous they were and how insightful they were and how brilliant they were for noticing the Republican Party was fucked up, you know, five minutes ago. And the same, and and why aren't people acknowledging this? And why won't why won't they congratulate? Why won't they admit they're wrong? And if you take the same dialogue and ask those same people about why did you treat liberals like shit for 30 years when they were telling you exactly this thing, all they will do is block you and walk away. Right. Because they cannot acknowledge – like like Republicans can't acknowledge truth. These people cannot acknowledge that history began before 2015. They can't because they were part of the problem. And if they acknowledge that – you know, Stuart Stevens sort of has. The rest of them can't. Because yeah. it blows their whole gig. The question then becomes, well, okay, if you were right starting in 2016, and this guy was right starting in 1980, why the fuck are you on television? Why isn't the guy <laughs> who was right all along? And and you were just neutral. You weren't you were you were working against these people who were right all along. You call them dumb and crazy and crackpot. How come you have the spotlight and they don't? And that's not a question that Steve Schmidt is prepared to answer. So it's not a question that his friends at the network are willing to ask. Anyway, um, things we thought would turn out to be important that turned out not to be. Going to bars. Yeah. Grocery shopping without a mask. And impeachment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it was not 20 years ago. The House of Representatives impeached Donald Trump. Less than a year ago, December eighteenth, two thousand nineteen, and the Republican, the Republican, the Republican Senate, other than Mitt, other than Mitt Romney, the Republican Senate acquitted him of all charges on February fifth, two thousand and twenty. 
Unbelievable. And it didn't budge the needle on Trump, his approval rating, or the Republican Party one inch. Right. That's right. insane. That tells you how deep the rot is on the right. Yep. 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 Just just remembering the past, folks. Yep. Uh, one thing we are grateful for uh, is is your stick to itiveness on listening to this podcast. Yes, we are. Uh, we have been watching our stats, and um, we've been noticing that some people listen to a podcast that's a month old and yes. are just catching up. And we want you to know we're always there for you. You can catch up anytime. Mm-hmm. Um, we're just glad you're with us, and thank you. Can I, uh, can we, you know, talk about our awards real quick before we go on to the news? Tell us about our awards. The, the lads over at Pod Save America, bless their hearts. Mm-hmm. You know, they have a little startup blog. You should give them some traffic. They're, they're trying so hard. <laughs> um, they have a new year-end award called the Pundies. The Pundies, right. Which highlights the worst takes by pundits and others going back like three or four years. Now, we here at the professional left have a follow-on award that we're calling the Sackies, which go to individuals or organizations which have sacked professional pundits and columnists for their consistently stupid, wrong, and horrible opinions. And here is the list of the Sacky winners for this year. Thank you, everyone. That concludes the Saki Awards for this year, because no matter how fucking wrong you are, you're never going to get fired if you're a conservative pundit spewing bullshit in the media. Or if you're a middle of the road pundit, unless you show your junk on Zoom, you're not going to get fired. There's the, we, we can only hope that. Well, no, it's too late. Too late. Because <laughs> no. Mark Shields retired this month. Uh-huh. I was hoping, kind of hoping that David Brooks would accidentally show his junk during the last episode of their, <laughs> their time. On I don't want to see that. Nobody no. wants to see that. But it's the only thing that will stop him, Blue Gap. We've tried garlic. We've tried silver bullets. We've tried crop. <laughs> Nothing stops David Brooks. <laughs> accidentally showing his wiener on national television. <laughs> uh, we're going to do a news roundup. Yeah. Uh, this hat tip, Oliver Willis, Mitch McConnell stole your $2,000. Yep. That's the message. That's the story. That's the story. Uh, the CDC predicts that the United States will see 400,000 coronavirus deaths by the time Trump leaves office later this month. Uh, tales of Brexit. We want uh, to share this guy in England. It was on Twitter. He runs an export business focused on selling eels in Europe. He voted for Brexit, and now he may go out of business. He thought it would open a new era of global markets for the UK. Yeah. Actually, yeah. the opposite happened, yeah. and now he doesn't know what he's going to do. I, 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 um, I, 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 as we said, he cut off the polls to spite his face. Yeah. Um, he decided. Yeah. I just, you know, this is endemic. It's and when we say polls, we mean Polish people oh, because yeah, the a great source of um, – the angry Brexit, pro-Brexit vote was that Polish people own small shops in London. Um, and, you know, they wanted they wanted them to speak English or something. Uh, but, and, but they wanted to keep them there because they wanted to retire and live on pensions. And they wanted those people to provide a tax base and run the things. Right. But and they, have a tax base. Right. <laughs> but they didn't want them coming into their country, which might remind you of a certain political party in this country. Yes, Absolutely. Um, when last we checked, Georgia was up uh, by almost 90,000 early votes who didn't vote in the general election. That is amazing. Way to go, Georgia. Um, the African-American share of that surge of voters is increasing and is now at around 40%, which is incredibly encouraging. Thank you, Stacey Abrams. Absolutely. And those postcard voters writers, one of whom I'm married to. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're working real hard. I got to say, we're we're sending out postcards to voters all the time. Uh it turns out Rudy Giuliani's star day drinking witness, Melissa Caroni, was not an election worker at all. She was a temp hired to clean the glass on voting machines. Now, I want to be very clear. I have nothing against someone taking a temp job to make ends meet. No. I have nothing against custodians. I think they do the mo- some of the most important work in the world. But uh, going in front of uh, television cameras and state legislatures in your state 
and lying about how much you know because of your position and your place and your ability to see what's going on. Your insider position, really. Your insider position is criminal. And she's in very big legal trouble for all the lying that she's been doing. I don't know. It seems to me that Rudy didn't do a lot of screening here, you know, Rudy, vetting of his his people. <laughs> Rudy's more of a screaming than a screening kind of guy. Uh, that's, yeah. that's what he does. Well, um, and I think he they've all taken a page out of Trump's books, which is put on a good TV show. And that's all you have to do. Well, and I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people ask, uh, how did on-camera underpants spelunker uh, Rudy Giuliani spend his New Year's Eve, you might ask? He spent it attacking Republican Quislings on Parlor. That's what Rudy <laughs> Giuliani is doing these days. So when you're wondering about why wasn't this more closely vetted and more, oh, it's a crazy person. He's a crazy, yeah. loud, demented old man who doesn't give a shit because he's got a, 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 a pardon ATM sitting behind him. So what does he right. care? Right. Um, today in This Is Why Fascists Always Sees the Radio Station's First News, this is from NPR, reading this from an NPR report. Michael Pack's stormy tenure over at the federal agency that oversees government-funded broadcasts abroad, including Voice of America, appears to be coming to a close. Yet President Trump's appointee has sparked an inter uh, internal outcry by taking bold steps to try to cement his control over at least two of the networks and shape the course of the journalism well into the Biden administration. Uh, Pack, who's the CEO of the U.S. Agency for Global Media, he also serves as the chairman of the board for Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty and Radio Free Asia. PAC and the members of the board have now added binding contractual agreements intended to ensure that they cannot be removed for the next two years. They could only be removed for cause subsequently. PAC stocked those boards with conservative activists and Trump administration officials despite a tradition of bipartisanship. In ongoing Republican vandalism news, the White House is stripping a good governance provision from the budgeting process that requires agencies to set goals and meet them in order to get funding, lifting the protocols just before President-elect Joe Biden takes office. The memo posted to the Office of Management and Budget website on Christmas Eve completely eliminates the requirement that agencies do strategic planning and publicly share progress in meeting their goals. Hmm. Uh, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine this week signed a bill requiring women to choose between burial or cremation of aborted fetal tissue. Yeah, and that's going to get overturned. Uh, they yeah. tried to do that in Indiana as well. Yeah. Um, but cool is the point. That it is the cruelty is the point. Absolutely. Uh, via Heather at Crooks and Liars. Hi, Heather. Hey, Heather. World's dumbest GOP congressman sues Mike Pence in last, last ditch effort to overturn the presidential election. Louis Gomert, who my dad mentioned Louis Gomert on the phone today. He my my father, my 84 year old father is well aware of who Louis Gomert is and said, what's up with him? He's he's insane. I said, you're, you think Louis Gomert's insane? You should see his voters, <laughs> the people that put Louis Gomert in office to represent them in Congress. Uh, but I digress. Uh, Louis Gomert filed a lawsuit this week making the ridiculous claim that Mike Pence has the ability to unilaterally overturn the results of the presidential election and decide not to count the electoral votes in swing states that Biden win. So they're suing Mike Pence. Yeah. This is this is the logic. Mike Pence can overturn the election, so we're suing him to make him do it. Uh, this month, Eric Alterman retired from the nation after 25 years. Sam Stein resigned from the Daily Beast. Ezra Kine le left Vox for a gig at the New York Times. And by the way, Sam Stein's going over to Politico. Oh, God. Um, yeah. Uh, Allison Hanschel, a.k.a. Athena, at uh, first draft has decided after 16 years that it was time to retire from blogging. And we love her. We love her. And uh, just wanted to say that. We love her. Well, she's so, working on a book, and she has a yeah, family. And yeah, she she's not stopping writing. Yeah. She's going to go write some other way. She's and that's awesome. She's on yeah. this Twitter thing. I don't think she's over at Parlor yet, but she's definitely still on Twitter. <laughs> um, she can dream. <laughs> dream. Yeah, we can um, all dream of being on Parlor. 
And, and again, exercising my right to remember things, during the 2016 campaign, you might recall that Donald Trump, ever heard of him, promised to eliminate the national debt in eight years. He was the just, king of debt. He's, he's the, the king, king of, debt. of debt. I'm going to get rid of debt. It'll be gone. Eight years. Uh, in just four years, Trump and the Republican Party have added $8.3 trillion to the national debt. He was going to pay pennies on the dollar to our debtors. Right. And he was going to take the U.S. to bankruptcy court and yeah. tell China to fuck off. And then he was going to institute a health care system that would be so much better than anything anyone on Earth had ever seen. And it would be at the fraction of a cost, of the cost, of the cost too. Yeah. All this yeah. stuff that, you know, you're not supposed to remember anymore because it's not fair to the people, to the feelings of the idiots who voted for this guy. By the way, Donald Trump keeps issuing contracts for the wall, too, although he doesn't own the land where the wall uh, can be built. He doesn't own it. That's someone else. ProPublica is writing about that. If you want to go check out ProPublica, they have a story about that. Trump signed the coronavirus stimulus package and spending bill to avert a government shutdown last Sunday night, but not before two unemployment programs expired, guaranteeing a delay in benefits for about 14 million unemployed Americans. Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, uh, certified that the signature match audit of mail-in votes in Georgia proved that there was zero voter fraud. Shortly after that, Donald Trump went on Twitter to rant about the Secretary of State's brother working for a Chinese company. This lie was picked up and repeated by Dick Morris on Newsmax Tuesday night, because, of course, Dick Morris has a job on Newsmax. Of course he does. Yes. Secretary of State of Georgia, Brad Raffensperger, does have a brother who is a private citizen and not discussed much. Uh, Brad also has sisters, but um, none of them are named Ron. None of them work in China, and none of them have to do with voting machine vendors. Bravo. Um, and sad story at the very end, but uh, an object lesson, I think, for you know why it's important to listen to public health professionals. Um, this is a quote from former Louisiana Congressman Luke Letlow on October 8th of 2020, so not very long ago. Quote, our economy is vital to the future of our state and our country. So while we've been cautious, and I think both the state and the federal level have taken numerous precautions for COVID-19, we're now at a place where... If we do not open our economy, we're in real danger. And why is Luke Letlow a former Louisiana congressman? Because he passed away from COVID on December 29th at the age of 41. COVID doesn't care, folks. No, no. And stop listening to these people who tell you it's safe and you can go outside. We can open everything up. They all have R's after their names and they're all lying to you. Um. <laughs> In local news today in our local newspaper on January 1st, which was a thin little newsletter, um, there was a charming front page below the fold story about a local man who collects photos with celebrities. That was the whole point of the article. That's it. It goes on and on. It has a lovely picture of him of with, him with silver, Glenn Close. With Glenn yeah. Close right there. <laughs> I'm looking for like some, you know, busting out. No. Local man collects celebra- photos with celebrities. Yeah. Front page news. Thank you, Drift Glass. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. We love you. And uh, big thanks to Tammy. Hey, Happy New Year, Tammy. Yeah. There's a, May it be a better year for everybody. We, uh, many of the podcasts I listen to, uh, far too many, actually, uh, spent the year end listing all the producers and extra producers and writers and creditors and people who've done research and, and their tech team. And we've got Tammy. And we love her and adore her and appreciate what she does for us immensely. Yes, we do. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is a bull calf from our friend Dogface Herman, who sent us Gravy. Gravy is about five months old and is a sweet little boy. He enjoys head and neck scratches and will lick and gently chew on your hand if he likes you. He's also a bit of a magician in that he can wiggle out of his blanket like Houdini escaping a straitjacket. Dogface Herman also shared this cat story with us. One time I came home with my hand covered in cow spit. My two kittens and adult cat were fascinated by the smell, 
When I tried to move my hand back, the adult cat reached out with claws and moved my hand back so he could smell it some more. This may seem strange, but then I remembered. Cats are weird. (laughs) Oh, yes. Gravy does like freshly poured grain. (gasps) Yes. Here's a New Year's resolution for those who don't have one yet. Resolve to let your kitties sniff the cow spit on your hands for as long as they want. I think that's something everyone can get behind. I think we can all agree with that. (laughs) And whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cow will sit in the pasture and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Gravy. He is an adorable cow at our Facebook page or website. And I know he's a bull. I know that. Yes. Um, He's adorable. You should go check him out. He's a cutie. He's a cutie is what he is. And you can send your internet kitty or other animal or pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information, all of it is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, well, Gal, the Internet Kitties are enjoying the Birds on Ice show that's developing on the front porch. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, loving. Let's forget about the whining and the crying and the shooting and the dying and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020. DGBG Productions.